Good evening. I'm Katya Mara, and I've been working with Medico International for many years. And I publish the Medico Circular once every quarter. And I'll be the moderator for the final panel on reconstruction of the world. And I thought I'd do it this way. I'll introduce the various panelists immediately before they take the floor. But before I introduce our first guest, Mark Haywood, let me briefly take us all back to the very beginning of our conference, where we kept a minute of silence for our friend and colleague, Lokman Slim. And when Said Patal talked earlier, that reminded me very much of that moment. It's not just about defending life. It is also about striving for the true life, even in the face of death. And that, that is the reason for re revolutions and revolts today. People risk their lives. That's what Musa Changari said yesterday from Niger, because they want to live an entirely different life. That was also true for Lokman Slim. He's a journalist, or was a journalist and filmmaker, creating an archive of memories on the Civil War. And we talked a lot about archives of memory today, and he was shot dead for that. He was a very straight, risk-taking fighter against Hezbollah and the regime of suppression and for the freedom of thought and action. That is just something I wanted to share once again. And not just that. Also yesterday, we had invited a colleague from India who was then told not to take part in our panel of Fridays for Future. She was Disha Ravi, and she couldn't attend because she was told it might get her into prison. Unfortunately, her cancelling her attendance didn't save her from prison. This morning, she was arrested by the Modi regime. So, although we've talked a lot about action today, we've got to take note of the fact that we here in the privileged north can think and act, and if we're doing it well, we might be sitting between two chairs, but that we're risking very little. And people in other regions, for their thinking, their striving for a different, for a true life, are really taking great risks. And that there is a hierarchy of dangers to which we're exposed in different ways. That just as a brief thought before we start this panel. The final topic is the question of what can we do? What can we do from here in Europe? And discussing that is something we ought to do by including a, the perspective of people not from Europe. That's why we invited Mark Haywood to talk to us. He's a journalist from South Africa. And Medico International, for many years, has been in touch with Mark Haywood. He works as a journalist and is one of the co-editors of the mostly read online newspaper in South Africa, the Online Maverick. But for a very long time, he was head of the Treatment Action Campaign. And that gave him worldwide renown, if you want, because he was one of the prominent fighters for equal access to antiretroviral medication for HIV AIDS patients making this a right accessible to all and not just the people in the privileged north. Today, I can see him already. He will talk about the consequences and effects of the COVID pandemic and the incredible scandal of vaccine nationalism as we're experiencing it today. Nowhere else does it become more apparent to what extent the world is built on the rule of the privileged and how stupid and short-sighted that kind of rule is at the same time. And with that, Mark, the floor is yours. Uh, good evening. And greetings from South Africa. Uh, it's my great privilege to join you at this conference this evening, and I have listened in on the last few hours and hope that you have had a successful conference that has generated anger and energy and ideas and a sense of possibility 
of what we need to do to change the world uh, that has been revealed to us again in the inequalities that have been unraveled by COVID-19. I feel privileged to be able to speak this evening and want to acknowledge uh, many years of comradeship uh, with Medico International, uh, working together in the trenches around rights of access to healthcare and rights of access to medicines. And I felt that after listening to uh, the presentation by Thomas Gebauer uh, that just preceded this, that really there's very little left uh, for me to say, because I feel that Thomas has very well articulated uh, the challenges we face across the globe, but in particular, the critical importance now of activists beginning to paint out a set of alternatives that can galvanize people around the world with the belief that a better society and a better world is indeed possible. I was asked to speak this evening about COVID-19 as it is affecting us here in South Africa and in developed, developing countries and about this issue of vaccine nationalism, which has now risen to the surface predictably, I have to say, completely predictably, uh, since the advent of the first vaccines at the end of 2020. But before I do that, and before I try to frame from the perspective of Africa what I think may be the responsibilities of Europe, I think it's very important to stress again how we should understand the challenge of COVID-19 uh, going forward. And in that regard, uh, I think it's important to see COVID-19 as a social justice question. Next Saturday, I think, is the World Day of Social Justice. And if there's one thing that COVID-19 has done, it has been to tear the mask away from the excuses for inequality and social injustice that exist around the world. It is not accidental that this pandemic is most out of control in countries with the greatest levels of inequality, in countries with the least freedom and in countries with the weakest and least developed of healthcare systems. I would argue that COVID-19 has disrupted a false dichotomy that built up between developed and developing countries, between the idea of North and South. And it's shown that vulnerability to disease is most closely connected with inequality, deprivation, and freedom wherever you are in the world, and that it exists within countries as much as it exists between countries. And picking up from something that Thomas said, I think that that fact requires a serious discussion about our understanding of solidarity at this point in the 21st century and the practical steps that must flow from that understanding. But I look at South Africa, and I look at South Africa as against countries like the United States, India, Brazil. And it's from countries that on the surface appear very different to each other, but in reality are undergoing very similar experiences of this epidemic, where it is the weak and most vulnerable and people of color and poor people who are most prone to illness and death from COVID-19 that I think helps us to understand what is going on. I think it's also important for this conference to keep in mind that we don't yet have an accurate picture of this pandemic, of its numbers, because we depend upon the capacity of health systems to measure the numbers of infections and the numbers of deaths. For example, in South Africa, officially, we have 1.5 million people who have tested positive for COVID-19. The reality is that there is almost certainly twice or even three times 
that number of COVID-19 infections. In fact, as I was preparing today for this conference, I came across an article with new research based upon antibody testing of people who have been blood donors in the course of uh, December and January of this year that shows that in one of our provinces, the Eastern Cape, 63% of the people who were tested, tested positive for COVID-19. Now, the Eastern Cape is not a country. It is a province of South Africa. But if it were a country, it would be the country with the highest mortality rate of any country in the world. And again, the reasons are not hard to find. They are due to poverty, due to malnutrition, due to the pre-existence of non-communicable diseases, and due to the collapse of accountable, open governance. I also have to say that what may apply for, to, to South Africa applies also across Africa and many other developing countries. It was said in the first wave of COVID-19 that somehow Africa was spared from the full force of this pandemic. And yet with the second wave of COVID-19 that started in November, December, and carries through until this day, we are seeing a much greater impact on fragile or non-existent uh, healthcare uh, uh, systems. And yet, because life is not measured and valued in many developing countries, neither is death or disease or morbidity accurately counted. So my argument to you, looking to Europe, is to understand that in developing countries, the impact of this disease, just on morbidity and mortality, before we even start talking about the social and economic impact, is in fact far deeper than you may have been led to understand up to now. And it links to the second point I want to make, which also relates to solidarity and relates to what Europe can do, which is that if COVID-19 took advantage of existing social injustice and inequality, the consequence of this epidemic is going to be to increase inequality and to deepen its structural, political, and economic determinants. So I think that we as activists have to understand that if we are unsuccessful in our campaigns, for example, against vaccine nationalism, or to try to ensure equity in the response across countries, that we will exit from the tunnel of this pandemic in a position where we are far weaker potentially against authoritarianism and corrupt governments than we were at the point that we went in. And therefore, I would argue that one of the greatest dangers that we face is that we control this pandemic and then return to normal. And I think the question we should be debating is not how do we get back to normal in inverted commas, but how do we prevent a return to the normal that existed and that gave birth to this global pandemic? Let me take my country again to try to illustrate the point that I'm making. In South Africa, COVID-19 and the lockdowns and the iron-fisted and anti-human rights and anti-poor means that have been used to try to limit transmission have cost at least three million jobs. Unemployment in South Africa is now over 30%. It has led to an increase in hunger. Over 12 million people are hungry and child malnutrition. And it has also, and this is something that is not sufficiently discussed, and I think it is true of many developing countries, had an impact on healthcare services for other pandemics and for other causes of morbidity and mortality. I believe that we have been set back by years, for example, in relation to tuberculosis, 
in relation to HIV, in relation to child immunization, and to many of the other basic healthcare services that we would argue constitute rights uh, internationally and in terms of our South African uh, constitution. And yet, although the poor have borne the brunt of COVID-19, the elites have been relatively untouched. And in some cases, the elites have prospered. So there is a danger that, say, for example, 12, 24 months down the line, a combination of vaccines and non-pharmaceutical interventions has curbed the transmission of the virus, that a strong argument is made by governments to neglect the social and economic consequences of this, uh, of this virus and to return to business as, as usual. And it's for these reasons that I think that it's necessary that we have a political understanding of what we are dealing with when we are talking about COVID-19. It will soon be a year since the epidemic or COVID-19 was declared a pandemic. And I think that we would all agree that up to now, the international response has been a disaster. The pandemic caught societies and governments unprepared. It took advantage of healthcare systems that had been weakened and eviscerated and privatized and underfunded. It came despite two decades of warnings of the danger of future viral pandemics. The global response has been uncoordinated. It has been without political leadership. It has not followed international regulations such as the international health regulations or respected rights. I heard pres presenters earlier on today talking about the overlap between COVID-19 and other socioeconomic rights. And if you look to the United Nations and the United Nations human rights machinery, it doesn't take long before you come across recommendations about COVID-19 and rights to water and sanitation, COVID-19 and rights of access to medicine, COVID-19 and rights of access to social security. And yet, none of those recommendations have actually been properly followed by governments as they implement their responses. But I don't think that we should be surprised about this because again, as speakers before me have said, one thing you have to keep in mind is that you cannot separate the response to this pandemic from either the political or the economic crisis that existed in our world. You can't expect miracles or for governments to rise above their own divisions and rot or for states weakened by capture, corruption and austerity to suddenly mount effective responses to a virus that whilst it places everybody at risk, places poor, marginalized, and vulnerable people at the greatest risks. The advent of vaccines certainly marks a new phase in the response. But again, the immediate inequalities that have arisen in vaccine access make it very, very clear that any expectations that vaccines might be a silver bullet in developed countries that will help us to gain control are, are fundamentally uh, mistaken. In South Africa today, not one single person has been vaccinated. Although in the weeks ahead, it is likely that a vaccination program will start in South Africa, the same cannot be said about Zambia, about Zimbabwe, about Malawi, and other countries in the region which are going to continue to bear the brunt of this epidemic without any uh, pharmaceutical intervention as a means for uh, assistance. And therefore, as we think through the trajectory, we have to consider that, 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 that COVID-19 is not going to be something that is transient, that is passing, but it is going to be a feature of development and inequality for quite a number of years uh, 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 to come.
in, in countries like mine. So I want to conclude just by asking what should be the pillars against which we measure the response to this pandemic, and I would suggest three. The first is the international human rights framework. The second, as is often said, is science, but that includes social science and not just medical science. And the third is the normal foundations of public health. This week, The Lancet, or two days ago, The Lancet set out the top three priorities for multilateral cooperation to suppress the pandemic and listed containment of community transmission, rapid vaccination, and increased emergency finance. But all of those are presented in a manner that is abstract and separated from inequality and the day-to-day -day realities of people who live in poorer countries. I agree with those priorities, but my very final point is to ask again what this means for activists in Europe especially. And I would suggest six points. The first is that it is necessary to go out of conferences like this and to mobilize in communities in a way that ties COVID-19 to other struggles such as the climate crisis, such as struggles around xenophobia and, 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 and migration. We have to build power. COVID-19 has made millions and millions more people see the shortcomings and failures of capitalism, but it hasn't shown people how to overcome the crisis that we face. And it is building that forward-looking program that is going to be critical. I would also say that it is necessary, as speakers before me have said, to strengthen the World Health Organization, but to do so within a much stronger framework of human rights and accountability, to demand accountability and transparency. And once again, as we did in the AIDS epidemic, to insist that the right to health trumps so-called intellectual property rights and to mobilize countries in Europe, for example, to support the request that was made by South Africa for a waiver of normal rules of the World Trade Organization in relation to intellectual property. If we cannot overcome intellectual property rights, we will be handicapped in our ability to mitigate the impact of this, of, of this epidemic. And finally, I would say there is a need to begin to develop and to demand a global post-COVID reconstruction plan. The trauma created by COVID is a trauma akin to other great watershed moments in human history. Whether it was the trauma of the First World War, whether it was the trauma of the Second World War, whether it was the point in South Africa when we emerged victorious after 350 years of colonialism and apartheid, and it needs a fundamental reset about social norms and priorities. And I would argue that that reset has to take place and build upon the existing framework of the international human rights uh, uh, movement. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, and I will now hand over to the speakers that follow me. But thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Mark, I have no one question on you. Mark, I have one more question to you. One thing that I keep wondering is why it is that we have not succeeded based on our experience with fighting patents and antiviral medications. Why have we not been able to learn from that? It appears that today it's even easier to enforce uh, patent rights for vaccines than it was back the then, what happened that we do not, uh, did not base ourselves on the global health crisis and have learned from that? You know, it's another discussion, but I believe that one of our failings as civil society is that we have not sufficiently learned the lessons of the struggle around HIV and AIDS. And certainly in South Africa, it, at times it feels as if we went back almost to square one in our approach to COVID-19. In the early 2000s, through until about 2007, 2008, 
particularly with the international mobilization that led to the Doha agreement in 2001, the pharmaceutical companies, the, 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 the brand name pharmaceutical companies were put on the defensive by arguments that access to medicines was a human right and by exposing uh, profiteering uh, by those companies. But I think after 2007, pharmaceutical companies were able to regroup because there was no longer a visible, powerful movement that was challenging the conduct of pharmaceutical companies. They reorganized to some extent their modus operandi. They gobbled up uh, generic uh, pharmaceutical companies which had provided alternatives that could be used for compulsory licensing. They tightened the noose against India, which we described in the early 2000s as the pharmacy of the world because of India's refusal to abide by uh, strict intellectual property rules. So I would say that part of the problem is that we, as activists, let down our guard at the point when we were successful ensuring universal access to AIDS medicines, but were nowhere near successful in dealing with access to other medicines for cancer, for tuberculosis, diagnostics, and so on and so on. Mark, vielen Dank. Mark, thank you very much. You said um, in an interview that was published by Medico that we cannot hear you, so it is our task also to make ourselves heard again and to not just hide behind our very own fear of COVID-19. We must understand what the consequences for the world are uh, in order to also go about it in a different activist way. Now, Mark has pointed to the changes also in pharmaceutical companies, and actually that um, might make for a nice segue to our next panelist. Our next panelist is Miriam Zagemaz. Miriam Zagemaz is a lawyer, and for many years, hello, Miriam. For many years, she has worked for the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights. And today, uh, she also is the deputy legal director. And we've known each other for many years now from our shared struggle. And we're trying, or uh, well, they're trying to go after companies based in Germany, corporations based in Germany uh, that uh, play a role in the exploitation of workers in textile factories in Pakistan, some of whom had to give their lives uh, for the terrible conditions. And they basically are the embodiment of what Sandro Mesandra talked about yesterday, absolute capitalism. So the question at this point is, this is also something that was the subject of many global discussions. Uh, is it possible to fence in the actions of these textile corporations, this brutal exploitation uh, by means of binding legal agreements, at least fence them in to an extent? Is there a way of taking small steps to take us away from uh, the rule of absolute capitalism? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for um, this truly highly interesting conference um, that I've uh, followed over the last few days as well. First of all, I would like to say a few words on why it is that we also have to look at the topic of the law in this connection. And why is it that legislation must also be viewed as one of the forums in which we need to take our fight? If you look at, and this is something that came clear in this conference because it was described repeatedly, the injustice of the global economic system. Now, if we wonder about how the global economic system functions, then it also functions on the basis of the law. And it is fair to say that it is not only the law that organizes uh, the economy and power, but it itself gives rise to power. It um, allows corporations and the elites in the world uh, to accumulate more power and to generate more profit. How does that happen? Well, law allows for access to resources. That is, 
It is specifically in a post-colonial fashion that free trade agreements, but also, as Mark mentioned, intellectual property rights are means to which corporations resort um, uh, in the Amazonas. Amaz um, there are certain uh, important drugs uh, that uh, corporations, uh, that drug the corporations appropriate and they prevent it from becoming an intellectual property. And at the same time, you have the extraction of resources and the generation of profits. These things are happening at an international level, also on the basis of investment protection agreements. Again, it's free trade agreements that apply here. You have access to a resource. You have access to a mine where something is being um, mined. And as an international corporation, you will have seen to it that you will have the right to export the raw material, to export the commodity, and to generate profits on that basis without, however, having to take any responsibility for the ecological or social consequences of said extraction. So that's the third part. That's excluding the rights of others. And the way in which this works also applies to international uh, law. The term of ownership, for instance, is protected uh, and is given priority over the interests of the general public or social rights or human rights, but it also works at a uh, more of a micro level on the basis of uh, the law governing corporations. Uh, complex uh, corporate structures are possible that allow corporations to act globally. At the same time, the individual entity of a corporation that is local somewhere will not have to bear any responsibility what's happening elsewhere in a different gov country. So um, profits generated in Colombia by Nestle based, Nestle based in Switzerland um, there can be a wonderful profit transfer agreement from a legal point of view. However, they're completely independent and they do not have to take responsibility uh, for anything that happens in the Colombian subsidiary. And the same applies, there's another spin to this if you think about global supply chains. Here, Corporate structures are only linked on the basis of purchase agreements. And in these purchase agreements, it is assumed that entities that have equal rights are entering into a contractual agreement without entering into any responsibilities other than exchanging uh, the agreed upon goods uh, against funds. And so outsourcing any responsibility uh, um, for labor conditions is also part of this. The same applies to production processes and upholding social and ecological standards. Right. So this is what is happening on the basis of the law. But still, we have to stay within the law. and. There are other rights also. There are social rights, human rights, collective rights that must be opposing or set against the rights of those in power. And there's another language of the law also that allows people to make demands. And that is the challenge. It's not just about the existing mechanisms and uh, using them to oppose the power of the corporations in the face of the climate change, the pandemic, human rights, and uh, the relationship between the human being, its rights, and the environment also have to be rethought. So as part of the human rights movement, we also have to take a more holistic approach. Human rights have to be defined as rights that a human being has also in connection with nature. And a Latin American speaker specifically um, explain that very nicely. I believe in Europe we have a lot more learning to do. We need to have a broader and more holistic understanding of human rights. Um, collective human rights have long been recognized. However, we do not enforce them enough, especially vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the 
the, the rights that are connected to a narrow understanding of uh, ownership or intellectual property. Also, I believe we have to very specifically in law, in the law, think about what it means to be held legally responsible. How can responsibility be defined given the nature of global um, consequences, glo global challenges? So what is, how does legal responsibility need to be defined in terms of um, historic causation of, for example, the climate crisis? And what does that mean also as it applies to multiple generations, to the to past generations, the current generation, and future generations? From a legal point of view, you always need to identify cause. So how do we think about cause in this global context? I believe that as lawyers, but specifically in our exchange with activists, these are topics that we need to tackle so as to be able to also counter the legal concepts that are put forward by the other side. So one of the forums where this can happen, where we, we can try to oppose this legally established economic world order, also include the UN binding treaty, which touches on uh, the f fact that corporations, specifically the headquarters of corporations, have to be held responsible. They have to respect human rights along the entire value-added chain. There are similar initiatives that are being taken at a national level in Switzerland, for instance. Um, there was an approach. I wouldn't say it has failed, but it has not made enough as much progress as you would have liked to see. But there are such projects in Germany and in France. In Germany also, there are discussions ongoing regarding a supply supply chain legislation, and that is what it is about, about um, alloc assigning responsibility to the European-based corp corporation. And it's about also changing uh, the fact that responsibility is being outsourced completely. So apart from these forums that are based on real political facts, we also, we at ECCHR and others, we also uh, have to go and enter into ongoing litigation. We want to see better legislation. We have to strive for better um, legislation, but we also have to put the law to use to also resist and to fight our hegemonial struggles, because the law can be used against those in power. The law that exists can be used against them, and we can say that we want the global economic order to work differently. One example is uh, that four workers from Pakistan have sued KIK, a German textile f fabric um, discount uh, chain, when they say we will ignore the fact that uh, the producers and the company that ordered from us are viewed as distinct. They owe us something because 55, 52 people have found their death in one of the factories. There are the farmers from India that have sued uh, Syngenta, the chemical corporation based in Switzerland. They're now taking advantage of Swiss consumer protection legislation, they're saying, we as farmers have used your pesticide, we're consumers of your products, users of your products, and we um, ha have seen people being injured and dying due to the use of this pesticide, and we, um, we, we call for redress. And the same is true when Mexican communities sue large energy corporations in France, where they say we may not have lost uh, 
our land yet, but this litigation that is ongoing is threatening our indigenous collective property rights massively, and we want to prevent this from happening. This is why we're taking this to a French court. We want to put this on uh, hold, and we want to be heard regarding our rights and the question of how our country is dealt with. So, so we have to get active in specific terms and make it clear time and again and tell the, these corporations that they are using the law in a way that even now is not legal. And we are claiming our rights. And by doing that, sometimes you will not be successful. You'll see partial success. But the fact alone that Indian farmers, for instance, are taking this to Switzerland, are going to Switzerland. The fact that Mexican indigenous communities are now being represented in French courts shows that you can object. And this is a bit of an outlook on what a different world could look like and what a different economic order could look like. One more comment or one more thought on the question of the legal approach possibly being too challenging, too taking too long. Certainly, this will only ever be partial solutions. However, if you look at this in the context of the pandemic, when the pandemic resulted in lockdowns and uh, operations being closed down in March and April of this of last year, 2020, that resulted in weeks or months of consumption pretty much coming to a standstill in Germany. That resulted in a massive wave of unemployment and economic ruin in countries such as Bangladesh. For European textile corporations over just a few days canceled all their orders and refused to pick up and to pay for goods they had ordered and that had already been produced. And within a few weeks, uh, Bangladesh's national economy was near bankrupt. And that again shows again, it points to the topic of uh, sustainability, and it shows just how much power resides in European corporations and with European consumers. Now, if indeed European corporations had already been obligated, or if they could have been sued to respect the right of, for so, of, on, to social security, and if that right to social security had been realized in Bangladesh, say, for five years, for it's been five years, 10 years, that companies such as Kik, CNA, H&M, if they had been forced to contribute to an effective social security system being established in Bangladesh, possibly even with um, an effective health care system in Bangladesh, then these textile workers would not have been in such a vulnerable position. Now, I'm not saying that it is up to corporations to ensure social security. I'm only pointing to the fact that there is great potential um, to also think this through, to think about what it would have meant had they had that responsibility. H&M and, and those corporations, they would have had to substantially change their business politics, their pricing, the whole procurement approach, and this whole fast fashion model could no longer persist if indeed they were um, obligated to um, comply with um, the social rights and social security requirements. So all these legal mechanisms may not represent the entire solution, but they certainly, from my point of view, are part of the solution they w that we must strive for and fight for. Das Lieferkettengesetz, was ich jetzt verstanden habe, das nicht nur in Deutschland existiert, sondern auch in Frankreich und anderen Ländern diskutiert wird, ist ja auch ein Hinweis darauf, dass es ein gewisses Unbehagen in den europäischen Öffentlichkeiten darüber gibt, dass für billige Kleider Arbeiterinnen in verschiedenen Regionen der Welt auf grauenhafte Weise ausgebeutet werden. Also es ist ja durchaus auch ein Erfolg von einer gewissen zivilgesellschaftlichen Bewegung und auch kritischen Öffentlichkeit. 
Sind sie denn so, dass man das, was du jetzt vorgezeichnet hast, auch tatsächlich realisieren kann? Oder sind sie dann doch wieder so schwach, dass letztlich dieser Wunsch, irgendwo werden Leute verantwort zur Verantwortung gezogen, äh, doch sich nicht erfüllt? Also, ähm, das... From my point of view, it's too early to say. Just two days ago, uh, there was draft legislation that was put forward by the ministry regarding supply chains. And you have to look at the text. Of course, it's the um, industry lobbyists that are doing a lot of work. Um, they've already excluded uh, civil rights liability. However, French legislation has entered into force. And since this year, actually since 2020, is it, it is possible to bring legal action on that basis. And of course, with laws and legislation, it's always about hegemonial struggles. Of course, the corporations are trying to interpret the law in such a way that no progress will be made, that it will just be a new version of corporate social responsibility. At the same time, I believe we have to take part in this struggle, because now it is about interpreting uh, this law, and it can be interpreted uh, in the interests of the corporations, but it can also be interpreted in a more expansive fashion, a progressive fashion, and that's another struggle, of course. And I think uh, in the chat, they're just talking about a Peruvian farmer who is suing RWE. Yes, um, it's it's been admitted. We don't know what uh, the result will be, but that's one of the forums where we have to take this fight. After comment, does one say since we might be hearing that argument more often, oh, it's so complex and it's the law, and I just want to readdress your position. You're also involved in the uh, lawsuit against torturers from Syria, the trial currently taking place at the German court in Koblenz, making apparent that global topics of legal action can thus be moved into the archive of global memory if those trials at least take place somewhere and human rights violation are the subject of such lawsuits, which isn't always to be expected, which is therefore all the more relevant. I'm sure we'll get many questions from the chat and I will give you the floor again later. In the course of the conference, one of the major topics was that we here in the North need to decolonialize ourselves. And we're looking back onto an inherited colonialization mentality of 500 years ago, as Sabina Haag put it. So our entire, the entire way we imagine the world's got to be put in question if we truly want to seriously address a reconstruction of the world. And that is why we now have Vanessa Eileen Thompson who's a doctor of sociology and at the moment is a scientific employee at the Culture of uh, Comparative Anthropology in Frankfurt Oder. Vanessa, hi. Your focus and teaching, uh, teaching focus is, amongst others, sectional inequality and gender research. In your contribution that I'm very much looking forward to, you will be addressing the relevance of abolitionism. And I have to admit that before this conference, I've never really um, looked at it. Uh, so I had to read up on it a bit. And also you address uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and what all of that has to do with the reconstruction of the world. So Vanessa, the floor is yours. Right. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here, and especially for hosting and coordinating this conference. And also, I would like to thank very much all those who are in charge of the technical equipment in the background, and also to those interpreting all of this into the various languages, thus making a major contribution to this conference being accessible, especially to people speaking different languages. The contributions of the last three days and the discussions have, in my opinion, addressed and 
criticized some of the fundamental and profound problems in this world, a world in a racialized, gendered, neoliberal capitalism, and have already also pointed out possible alternatives. And following on from some of these contributions, I would now like to talk about abolitionism as a reconstruction of the world. And in particular, I'd like to focus on the struggles for black lives, which particularly last year, given the background of the Black Lives Matter movement and protests, has received quite a bit of attention. In the panel on Haiti two days ago, it was already pointed out that the struggles for and around black lives go back a long way, historically speaking, and also have one of their beginnings in the Haitian Revolution, in the first successful revolution of enslaved black people. Last year, we have seen updates, if you want, of that revolution, albeit under different auspices. The Black Lives Matter protests, and I would like to point out at this point that BLM also stands for Black Liberation Movement. And these protests cannot be reduced to last year, and also they did not just start in 2020. But I believe it is fair to say and quite significant that particularly given the pandemic background, this it was these protests and mobilizations which uh, also mobilized quite a bit of um, trans uh, protest again. And at the moment, they currently are the biggest transnational mobilization in the history of anti-racism. And that's not just in the US, but also in Europe or some countries in Africa. For example, the NSARS protest in Nigeria, or also the protest against police violence in Kenya. And also there were several Black Lives Matter protests in South America. The protests and movement movements were ignited around police violence, and here especially against poor and multiple marginalized black people. But they also fight against other and intertwined forms of state violence, such as they are produced by prisons, camps, or border military regimes. The transnational movements around Black Lives Matter also fight against environmental racism against austerity, austerity policies and exploitation, also against domestic and sexual violence, rejectionism and homelessness, for the expansion of social health care and for ecological, social and intersectional justice. I would now like to address two points that I believe are not only helpful but fundamental to the question of reconstructing the world in context with these struggles and perspectives. The first point concerns the aspect of entanglement or the entanglement of the struggles. In the struggles for black lives, the entanglements of institutions of state violence are taken into account. For example, the entanglement of urban policing and policing of the seas, or also the rather complex entanglement of camps and prisons. Angela Davis and Gina Dent put it like this, the prison is a border and the border is a prison. The management of groups constructed as superfluous. But we also see a connection, a standardization, a politization when it comes to the camps at the external borders and those camps that also exist within, say, the countries of Western Europe, for instance and very often cause premature death, which is also what the campaign Legalization Now is pointing out. The movements, however, also point to the entanglement of nationalism and imperialism, and this through an externalization of borders that increasingly reactualize imperial relations. And another entanglement concerns the analysis of the interaction of state violence and interpersonal violence and that a critique of violence must, or criticism of violence, must take both into account. So we see here not just a decidedly intersectional perspective when it comes to the suppressed uh, identities and experiences, but most of all an entanglement of struggles 
where critique and protests from the movement also are pointing at the intersectionality of inequality structures. My second point concerns the perspective that radical black theorizations and movements enable, and this is linked to a radical critique of liberal cosmopolitanism and uh, the liberal concepts of security, citizenship, and also human rights. That is, the concepts and norms whose genesis is inherently linked to the violent tendering, exploitation, and dehumanization of much of humanity. Franz Fanon pointed this out in 1961. He said, it is necessary to leave Europe in order to save the world. And the title of this panel here is The Responsibility of Europe. I'm quoting Fanon here. Leave this Europe where they're never done talking of man, yet murder men everywhere they find them, at the corner of every one of their streets, of their own streets, and in all the corners of the globe. End of quote. In The Damned of the Earth, Fanon elaborates the, the dif differential and destructive logics of colonial capitalism, and he also shows that the damned of the earth, les damnés, are produced through over-exploitation, criminalization, and dehumanization. At the same time, he suggests that colonial capitalism not just produces the damned, but also damns the earth. So abandoning Europe, in Fanon's sense, refers to the radical break with liberal political and social concepts and economies and relations. And at the same time, it opens up new worlds and horizons. Akil Mbembe pointed this already out this morning. The world cannot be reconstructed solely on the basis of the values of the European Enlightenment. And also Musa Changari's words mean to me that everything, or when he says that everything must change, I see it in the same context. The transnational abolitionist perspectives and theorizations of black radical critique, as they are also evident in the struggles for black lives, remind us that the problems in this capitalist world, gendered and racialized over-exploitation and extractivism, war and the expansion of security regimes, border regimes, camps, prisons, rising poverty, intersectional violence, health apartheid, the production of premature deaths, the increasing use of violence in political and socially problematic situations. All of this cannot be solved through including it in liberal frames and orders of security, of property, of subjectivity or of law. Orders, that is, that run along necropolitical and binary dimensions. The struggles for black lives do not advocate reforms of state violence or reforms of the border industrial complex, but rather for abolition as a radical reconstruction of world. So what does abolitionism mean? It does not simply mean abolition, but the creation of new relationships, ways of life, institutions and structures in which uh, life can flourish, as Ruth Wilson Gilmer puts it. Yesterday, we talked about the revolution for life. Abolitionism is historically and also currently a fundamental part of that revolution, from the struggles for the abolition of plantation economies and enslavement, that is where colonialism stems from historically, so a movement struggling for the abolition of plantation economies and enslavement, but also the struggles against colonialism and neocolonialism. And it is particularly the collective contributions that are often made unseen, invisible by women, by marginalized groups, where the practices of abolitionism are articulated as a revolution for life. And the same, at the same time, and that takes me to my third and last point, reconstruction understood as embedded in practices and horizons that are partly already there. So it's not just about the futures outside of our current world, but practices that are already there at the margins and also in very marginal ways already exist. Established in the Maroon communities in the Caribbean and in the Americas during times of slavery, 
the forms of the very liminal or also ephemeral infrastructures of criminalized, of exploited or illegalized people, in the practices of mutual aid and relational solidarity, and in the care politics of marginalized, especially of queer and trans collectives. Reparation, thus, does not neither refer only to the past nor to purely monetary questions or questions of mere survival. Abolition is a presence, that's how Ruth Wilson Gilmer puts it, and it is a practice of radical interdependence and relationship. In all this struggles for black lives as an abolitionist project of reconstructing the world are inherently in solidarity. In the case of Black Lives Matter, we can see that these are struggles in solidarity with the indigenous and other marginalized and exploited groups. So it's not just about black people. From an abolitionist perspective, blackness is a politics of solidarity. From the designation of blackness, such as in the context of Haiti, where everybody is called black or was called black, who actively stood up against slavery, or then the political blackness as part of the anti-racist mobilization in the 20th century, and also the Black Lives Matter movement as a transnational multiracial movement. These transnational interconnections or entanglements of Black Lives Matter, while at the same time reducing and abolishing systems of state violence and global violence, provide the very fundamental basis for a solidarity reconstruction from below and democracy based in solidarity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vanessa. And it was very important that you introduced this notion here. And possibly we could have one follow up question. Why use the term abolitionism? And why bring that into connection with what Mark Haywood just said, who said after the pandemic, we are running the risk of ending up with an exacerbation of institutional violence, not just here with us, but uh, all the attempts of ex executing social control over the pandemic also in countries such as South Africa threaten to exacerbate institutional violence. And with this kind of fluid term of abolitionism, as you introduced it, can that help us to broaden it further, to point out the risk, which is quite evidently there, that institutions will exacerbate institutional violence? Yes, thank you. I think, on the one hand, the history of abolitionism, starting from the struggles against slavery and colonialism, always went along with a radical reconstruction of democratic societies. So it was never just about the abolition of slavery, but towards what was then referred to as abolitionist democracies. And when it comes to the continuity of abolitionism and slavery, then despite of the formal, and that would be my critique of the law, despite of the formal abolition of slavery, despite of the formal abolition of colonial um, rules of possession and colonialism, in a certain way, the general societal framework conditions haven't greatly changed. In the US, for instance, there's more people now, also black people now, imprisoned than ever worked on the plantations. And many of the institutions, the police force, the prisons, have actually taken over a lot of the practices of colonies and plantations in an updated version, admittedly, but uh, they persevere. And this new type of abolitionism, especially ab abolitionism since the 20th century, is very much focused on s institutionalized state violence. 
and the abolition of that, the reduction of that, if we talk of prisons, then it's about the deep imprisonment of the society, the reduction of punishment regimes, same with the police force, but also camp and border regimes. These perspectives are important because they very decidedly deal with the historical continuity of punishment, penalty and exploitation and how that works in neoliberal capitalism and at the same time focus on a radical transformation of structures and institutions which are life embracing rather than life destroying or punishing or also using excessive violence and especially against this backdrop of the pandemic that we find ourselves at a crossroads, if you want. The question of the portal was addressed. How do we go through this portal? And I think that it's important also, looking back at what Mark Hayward said, I would quite agree with him here, what we need is a reconstruction plan. How do we want to do this to collectively commit and advocate addressing the risk, but also the expansion of punishment regimes as we have them already. If we look at the camp uh, regimes, at uh, the expansion of punishment uh, regimes, it needs mobilization to curb that, to contain that, else there can't be any spreading of social structure, social justice. Great. Thank you very much, Vanessa. That was very fascinating, and I think it'll help us go further when it comes to the question of what's the responsibility of Europe. Uh, now, last, I would like to ask Milo Rao to speak, but let me remind you what Susan Buckmore said, that nothing is obvious, that we have a lot in common, even if, if there isn't a single revolutionary thing. She said, aesthetic formats are required where we can frame what is irreconcilable. Hello, Milo. So I, I can again uh, advertise your film, say that we'll uh, show it. Uh, she was thrilled with your film, and just in case you didn't hear that, the new gospel, because it takes things and puts them in a f context, in a frame, in a surprising way that do not really belong together. What was shown was reminiscent of uh, Da Vinci's picture, but that there were these were migrants from Italy, illegal migrants. So Milo is with us. His Institute for Political Murder also is supporting this conference. Thank you for that. Let me briefly introduce him. He is a director, writer, and uh, artistic director of the Antigent Theater in Belgium. And I do hope that you'll be able to say a few words about how art and uh, how a political aesthetic can bring about something that we can share, that we can have in common, something that we can risk something for, and that it is good uh, to continue this um, even if it's impossible to obtain, uh, attain the new life. First, I'd like to apologize just in case I don't get through all that well. I'm sitting in an apartment uh, here in Geneva for guests, and I have no influence on uh, the connection here. If it's not good enough, please let me know via the chat, and then I'll switch off the camera. Thanks to Mark Haywood. Miriam and Vanessa Thompson for what you've already said. There are a great number of things that I'd like to touch on. Now, to start with a new gospel and this picture that was just being alluded to. Yes, in fact, it is uh, illegal. It is refugees, but it's also a peasant farmers from Italy. It's men, it's women, it's the, the Christians and atheists that are sharing the Last Supper in this picture. And that's also um, the theme of the considerations that I would like to add. And in many regards, I can uh, refer to what uh, Miriam and Vanessa have said. That is the relationship between uh, the law and 
rights and how um, what the timely dimension of time is and the standards that are established on the basis of law and an illegalization and exclusion of people which happens on the basis of law, their enslavement as it were. And what I'm also interested in is how we can obtain global solidarity or even a perspective as to what solidarity could be. And Vanessa spoke about leaving Europe to save the world, the quote, or just to understand the world and to understand what might be possible within Europe or what cannot be thinkable, what is not thinkable within Europe or within European myths. We've had a number of projects, Orestes in Mosul, for instance, or Antigone uh, in Amazonia, uh, where we exported European myths in order to read them. Antigone, for instance, we did together or we worked on in connection with th those in Brazil who do not have land. And in German legislation, territory land that is not being used or that was appropriated on uh, without a legal foundation can also be occupied that's not only possible in brazil i could do it here close to cologne in theoretic theoretical terms it could be done on the basis of the constitution the same is true in italy where we occupied houses in the context of the new gospel i'd like to touch on this one project that we just worked on and talk about this general question of to what extent solidarity is feasible. In activist contexts, frequently we have a myth of difference. That makes it difficult to show solidarity, and frequently these differences are plastered over. That there's a risk of this happening, and one uh, reason why solidarity is often made difficult is that in contexts of exploitation, um, we live in contexts of exploitation, and um, in the space of art, something else is very hard to realize or to even imagine because they are just a given. I believe in the arts, we have two possibilities of showing solidarity. One is short-term solidarity in the form of projects by just saying, let's do it as part of the new gospel. We said we will try to uh, put the new gospel in the form of a film in City Matera, where Pasolini and Mel Gibson also did their film in the 60s and in 2000 with the similar approach. But with the, the, these people who almost ironically or in truth happen to live uh, in the vicinity of this city, thousands of refugees who are being exploited on uh, in tomato plantations close to this European uh, cultural capital. And we put together a cast where Jesus himself happened to be an activist from Cameroon who is fighting for the rights of African for farm workers, and we have a whole number of apostles with sex workers, refugees from other countries were cast for those positions because the main strategy, the rule of the uh, mafia in Italy is based on divide and conquer and is making solidarity impossible. Uh, there are so many groups who live in the system and suffer from the system of uh, monoculture and exploitation and they are con exploited against each other. Romanian workers would never work with the Italian peasant farmers. They would never want to work with African refugees. And th these various countries are played off against each other. There were people from Cameroon, from Nigeria, from Sudan, from Congo whom we uh, brought together also with the help of Italian unions, with Romanian organizations, with NGOs who, uh, and, and we try to bring about a spirit of solidarity um, in this project. So what we attempted was to take this transcendental concept of um, justice, of the 
Bible and we wanted to run a campaign for the rights of these people. And um, when Miriam spoke, I very much had to think uh, of one word um, from Matthew's Gospel when Jesus entered Jerusalem and he told the priests, I have not come to uh, abolish the law, I have come to complete it. And in other words, the laws that we need are in place. In Euro the European legal framework, as far as I know, there is a no such concept as an illegal immigrant. You do not even have, there isn't even a possibility of being illegal. Either you're within proceedings, you're part of proceedings already or not yet. But from a legal point of view, it's not possible to exploit people in Italy because they are illegal. And there's this circle of not having a residence, not allowing you to work, and not having work does not allow you to have a place of residence. And, and then you have the Dublin agreements that prevent these people from leaving Italy at the same time. They're stuck there. So we said, let's have a project of art that breathes fiction into this concept that and at the same time, we will have a lot of people cooperating in this project, a campaign on the basis of dignity where we try to enforce rights. We occupied houses. We were supported by the church also. And on the basis of these, um, this occupation activity, these people had a possibility of um, trying to get work permits, so we tried to take advantage of the system when we included people in this project. So that's a short-term approach as part of globalization. There's another project that we did together with ECCHR, the World Parliament, amongst other things, where we also cooperated with medical, where we said, let's take the national limits of law and national policy and leave those behind us and try to see eye to eye at a, a global economy level. Uh, this global supply chain legislation, this initiative for corporate um, responsibility is something that unfortunately failed in Switzerland. It um, did not get through also because the Swiss government misinformed the general public. Um, but let's pretend we said as if these this legislation were already in place. And at an artistic scale, you also have to say that still these cases are complex and still there is no clarity. And complexity does not just dissolve and go away. So in the arts, people also experience disappointment for a, a moment. They may see the possibilities prosper. They may see things opening up, and then it changes again. And that's where I feel a long-term strategy applies. Going back to the new gospel, of course, you can't just create a revolt of dignity or for dignity. The Italian unions and the NGOs and the activists from variant countries did come together. And it's not enough to just market the film. Uh, the ways in which this film is being distributed also have to be based on solidarity. That is also something that needs to be aligned with the way in which you produce the film. And the connections that are being forged, these networks on the basis of dignity and solidarity that are then illustrated as part of the project and that can persist for, say, two months' time, that's the underlying vision of uh, making movies, of uh, doing theater, that what you try and claim and want to make happen is being put into practice as part of a project. But this utopia, this utopian realization, then also needs to be translated into, translated into a long-term realization where viewers as can also have a, a role and take responsibility as consumers of this art. So these distribution channels also have to be such that they are accessible. And in parallel to making this a movie, together with the NGOs, these 
tomatoes that the apostles and the movie Jesus were had been planting were then brought to 15 different supermarkets in Germany and in Austria, hopefully eventually also in Switzerland. And the interesting thing is you could say the nice thing about capitalism is that it's immoral. It is in line with what consumers want. And it is true that when it comes to food, almost all types of food, there is a fair alternative that is available to the things that are typically purchased. And just a week ago, we had a presentation with Delays, that's the largest chain of supermarkets in Belgium where I happen to work. And we, we, we told them we have all these eco st stops that take our tomatoes. Why don't you also sell them? Because uh, these products that are produced in fair ways are not more expensive. It's just that the profit is uh, distrib distributed in a, uh, in a more equitable way. And this supermarket chain said, well, that's, that's great. However, as soon as we start offering this project product, we'd be at the same time saying that all the other products that we're offering are uh, manufactured in a mafia kind of way. And, and, uh, and that, that is something that showed me a glimpse of what was going on in the mind of the supermarket manager. And this is the same thing we see crop up when there are votes or when as in the case of CCHR, when um, they win a case in court, because then you see that's what the law was made for. That's when justice and law, in fact, come together, are brought together, and when they establish a case of precedence. So being aware of that, uh, and we have to make sure that people understand that that's the symbolic, that's what the symbolic power of the arts is for, where this difficult, contradictory process that you realize something that ought to be, that it is realized along with all its negative aspects, and that you try to um, also consider the temporal aspect a way of thinking that at least for a moment reflects uh, the the global nature of the problem. Say a German um, energy supplier might be responsible for a mountain um, sliding down somewhere. So being trying to work on this and make that visible as part of arts projects and to almost try to make it normal and that's what's happening in the arts, to translate that into practice. A project of art is always something that is collective in nature. A theater project can only ever be um, put on stage with 15 people, more people, and it is this collective that gives shape to what could become social law. So the arts basically forge precedents. And sometimes it doesn't even matter so much what is found by the courts, but it's just the possibility of bringing action, of um, allowing for the possibility of bringing action, that there is a legal process that makes this possible. As Miriam has said, these small, partial, and sometimes unsuccessful spaces that have to be created within which this can happen. And to conclude, I'd like to go back to the Bible. If you think about the European uh, culture or the culture in the Near East, it has given rise to this myth of the New Testament. And what is remarkable about this is that this book illustrates two things that, I don't know, may also be reflected in a lot of other uh, sacred texts. One is revolution. the revolution fails. Jesus was uh, doomed to the most violent death available at the time. and. Uh, it fails because solidarity fails in his small group. He is being denied. Uh, there is a traitor in his very own group, and he 
And so it's a very dialectic book, as it were. And at the same, on the basis of this failure, uh, strength arises because it's been shown what could have happened. And that's what's interesting. That's what we found interesting about this book, although I myself personally happen to be an atheist, of course. And that's true for almost everyone who took part in this. Thank you. I do hope I didn't speak for too long or not long enough. No, this was great. Thank you very much. I've learned we can leave Europe without leaving Europe and that art creates the bridge to possibly also making for movements and utopian areas which we perceive as marginal areas and still can constitute a different utopia. I suggest the following. We are running incredibly late. I will allow two very brief questions from the audience. And this incredibly long discourse on the possibilities of change will be brought to an end for here and now to be continued elsewhere. So, Julia, any questions from the audience in the chat? She'll then summarize them for us. Yes, hello, there's quite a few questions here, but we've been discussing this backstage. Can we really pick individual questions after this incredibly wide uh, range that you've covered. Can we really pick individual questions? And we decided, no, we can't pick any single question here now. Can't do that. So we said what we like to do is address the question of what does it mean for us? Question for what can we do? That's what many of the audience asked, not uh, any kind of theoretical scientist or full-time activist, but really, can I put it like that? very normal quote-unquote citizens, you know how I mean it. What can we do? And Akil Mbembe and uh, Yvonne this morning were quite skeptical whether this is possible, whether the world can be reconstructed as a world or place worth living. And we also learned colonialism in Arab means uh, reconstruction. So what would you say now? What are the options for reconstruction, also from an individualized political perspective? At this moment in time, COVID-19 as a true rupture or fracture point in the history of mankind. And to not make it too uh, banal, maybe, maybe in your answers, you could try to give Milo Rao an idea for the next film. So maybe in such a poetic notion that Milo Rao might find some material in that. That would be our final question. <laughs> okay, right, we need all of the panelists for that and Milo will take notes whether he could turn it into a movie and all of you are now required to be creative. Mark, you go first again. Okay, I'll be very brief. What can we do from the, from what can we do? I, I think a crucial thing is that this crisis has spawned a million new initiatives uh, at community level, aimed at new food systems, aimed at new education systems, aimed at tackling racism, aimed at tackling exclusion. Uh, it's been quite phenomenal uh, how people have been forced to build from below. I guess my suggestion is that it's important for people to become involved with those initiatives and to support those initiatives and to try to see what can be done to ensure their sustainability. But what worries me is, that, is whether we have sufficient time to build from below whilst there is a clock ticking very fast above us, which is that of the climate crisis, which is the deepening inequality created by the COVID-19 crisis. So it is how do we blend building power at the community level with, with in uh, Vanessa's words, attacking, abolishing the superstructures that, uh, that, that, that currently govern us. And I think 
what I've learned from this discussion is that we shouldn't throw any tools out of our toolbox. Uh, law is critical, uh, but law needs to be accompanied by, by social organization and social mobilization if we are going to get the benefits of the law. Human rights can either be a liberal uh, and disempowering con concept, but I also believe that human rights and capitalism are increasingly incompatible, and that therefore it would be a mistake to, to, to deconstruct and do away with the idea of human rights. I think that we haven't yet found the radical potential that exists uh, 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 with, with, within human rights. And then the final thing is that I, uh, is again to agree with Milo, is that I think we have to find a new language. I think there's a real danger that all of us on this panel, all of us in this conference, speak a language that is alien and is difficult to understand by the people who are on the front lines of the crisis, of different aspects of this world crisis. So we have to find ways of talking, of doing through poetry, through theater, through art, that allow resonance and build empathy and build, build power. Those all sound like very abstract, apolitical suggestions to the question of what can you do in, in, in Europe, but, but let me, that's the best I can do in a few short minutes. Thank you. Miriam? Miriam, next, please. Now, if I can come up with any sensible idea for a film, I'm not so sure. But anyway, my thoughts on this. Yes, I would absolutely agree with what Mark said in a great many respects. I also believe that the pandemic currently, Black Lives Matter, Friday for Future, have given lots of options of becoming committed at a very personal, a very local community level, joining your network of solidarity, so to speak. And I also believe the pandemic situation, the lockdown as we have it at the moment, confronts us with a great more many questions at a very small scale. How can I show solidarity in a different way? For example, how is the work distributed, how is care distributed, and so on. There's lots of potential in that. But still, I believe, as Mark just put it, not throw away our classical toolbox. There are political processes which we can still influence also now and today. And something like the initiative against uh, corporations in Switzerland is a good thing just like the supply chain initiative going on at a EU-wide level now. Opinion polls show the majority of the population, both in Switzerland and in Germany, the absolute majority say, we don't want to profit from exploitative supply chains. We want different products. That's been reflected in the recent election, or rather in the result of that uh, survey in Switzerland. The majority of the Swiss uh, voted in favor, but it was connected to questions of also uh, voting law, why it didn't work out. But there are opinion polls. Also in Germany, more than 75% of people in Germany say so. So we want to further influence the political process, so we want to and need to influence our political parties. Now, this is down to real life politics, really, but we've got to voice it like that, too. And everybody acting in any way or other. That's how Thomas Seibert once put it. We need to be able to tolerate this feeling of uneasiness as Europeans. We are entangled in so many fold ways. We are privileged so much. We profit from exploitation and we are taking our planet to the limits. And this feeling of helplessness and the anger that that creates is something we need to learn and be able to tolerate. But try to give it a productive turn presently when it comes to our personal life, but also in the classical political sense. And maybe there's also other ways where, as Milo put it, you can use the network of dignity. I wouldn't know where to look for it, professionally speaking, but there's certainly a great many other options that we as citizens can find and, and look for. Vanessa, what's your film outline? I'm not so sure if I could turn it into a film either. What might be an idea for a movie possibly is, how about 
these forms of solidarity in practical life? What will they look like? Not just at the level of official tribunals and the lot, but ways of caring for each other. Many of the practices of Black Lives Matter and others, collectives of uh, refugees across Europe, but also transnational solidarity that uh, many of these groups have developed and are simply practicing. I think we can learn a lot from that. And I find it important here, too, to look at how is it brought across, so to speak, using instruments of art, of creative forms. But I also find it important to point out that many of these movements are already using artful forms or of expression already. The practices of welcome amongst those who were victims to the right-wing attacks at Hanau in Germany, there was a lot of expression through means of art and uh, performing art as well. So that is always important part of it, I believe. And maybe briefly, regarding the aspect of we need to build from below, so organizing from below, I think it's also important here, as was mentioned previously, there's a great many tools that we have already, and people do it on a daily basis, taking care of each other, practicing solidarity in their everyday lives, also beyond their immediate neighborhood, say. The struggles of migrants in the European context, but also transnationally speaking, they go a long way back. The struggles of many of these groups and groupings that are systematically excluded and in a way are also often um, subjected to premature deaths, they also go a long way back. And it's important to also locate oneself in that history. Obviously, we are partially confronted with new challenges, but there's a lot of a wealth of knowledge already when it comes to dealing with and forms of caring for each other. We can learn great things from, say, the queer movements um, with regard to AIDS and HIV crisis. At the same time, referring to fights against uh, border regimes or maybe a rekindling of the flame of the anti-militarist movement, say. When we want to look ahead, it's always worth looking at what was there and what still is there and what's currently being practiced that we can still use and benefit from. And I think that's also important to say in connection to the question of what is it that people can do now. In all kinds of contexts, there are structures of support, support groups for people seeking refuge. And also beyond the Black Lives Matter context, there are different groups dealing with the question of how can we create safety without a violent ridden institution such as the police force. And I think it's important to dock on to that and get out of this political feeling of helplessness, of powerlessness that is part of the pandemic, and to break out of that and remain in touch and in relation. May I make one interjection as the moderator? What do we do with fear? How do we deal with fear that has pretty much entered all of our living rooms via COVID-19? Pointing out concrete practices of solidarity I find impressive, but I also have the uh, impression that there's a lot of fear out there, many people feeling isolated, and also in view of the fact that this is, can only be the beginning of something. The fear of the high level of uncertainty out there in the world. It, is there anything, Milo, that we can do to confront that with the means of art, rather than being shocked into stillness, as so many people are? I have to say, fear, I mean, after what Vanessa just said, I find it hard to add anything else. She really covered it all, I believe. Fear is often a result from the fact of believing that one's the first to experience that, so no history. Fear, 
as a result of being unable to have, say, a design for the future? Or if so, uh, there's nobody else or not daring to raise one's voice or not knowing whom to raise one's voice with. And now, under COVID, practical forms of being together, solidarity and presence, and that's what very much art and theater and film is about. I mean, you can perform a play via Zoom, you can do everything, but the actual idea of spending time together physically, that's gone. And that can be a problem. And then all of a sudden you realize, that's at least what we realized, you therefore enter much more into a global exchange. You start participating in Zoom conferences, which to me was a total eye-opener, I have to say. It's just a very simple example. The theater and also distribution of my films, they'd always blocked it off. They either said, we'll bring it out in the cinemas or we won't show it at all, uh, only in this one cinema. And all of a sudden it was screamed, streamed free. And all of these channels now can't be blocked again, can't be closed down again. So the intellectual property right, it, it can't be restituted. I mean, we're realizing now that it's going back. There's now some out there who say, we'll stream this uh, play online, but it'll cost you four euros to see. And you've got to really stay firm here as producer and also as consumer, saying, no, you can't turn back the clock here. We'll stay where we were, where, as an exception, we really ventured out far for a change. Final point, how to bring together say, the alien language, as we said, and the simple, basic democratic project. What can you do in your neighborhood? Who can you go shopping for? What can you produce? How to bring the two together and how to prevent the uh, experience that we've had here amongst each other, the generation before us or other, generation, uh, other cultures 2,000 years ago, that it gets lost time and again. And this neoliberalism keeps us, uh, keeps us kind of chained to the present. How to prevent that? So, what are general ways of life where you're in connection with your own past and your own future and others too? That to me is really the main driver that gets me to ask, how can I do that? Thank you very much indeed to all of you on the panel online. I think this was so fascinating that I'm wide awake now again, although I've just sat through three days of conference. And those who haven't been able to follow it all the way through will be able to see it later on YouTube. I think it's well worth its while. And I'll now say the very final words here for this conference and would like to say thank you to all of the technical staff in the background, to the interpreters, to all of the colleagues who did the moderations and co-moderations who helped preparing the conference. There was a great many people more involved than were seen here. And for all of us, I believe this was really a major and a very important experience and I also believe has once again inspired our work and, and taken it to another level and certainly motivated us to continue. At the very end, let me come back to a black revolutionary, Fred Hampton, who died, uh, who in 1969 was murdered at the age of 21. To the FBI in the US, he was the messiah but they still had him killed. And since we talked of revolution so much, I was thinking of a scene from a movie where there were reports on this, how Fred Hampton, aged 21, had a meeting with black and white people, with different people, and how he practiced with them, saying, I'm a revolutionary. And people first were very hesitant in saying that and then they said it louder and louder and at that moment all of them were convinced they were revolutionaries they can overcome their fear and maybe something else is possible than the shitty past uh, present as it is and if that is one of the results of this conference i'd be more than pleased and we'll meet again on a great many different channels and hopefully also physically and in real life thank you very much and goodbye